and then we'll just keep the rest of the corks <coughs> over, over here <laughs> for no reason. <laughs> I'm not old, I'm just in pain all the time. Hello you dirty potters, how are you today? So I have good news and sad news I guess? This video is the last kill node that you will not only be seen in this house, in this setting, but is also the last kill node you will be seen in this kiln. Not only am I moving, I'm also getting a new, bigger and better kiln. And you know, the stuff is nothing special, and I don't have that much stuff, I really don't have like a full, full kill and load, but I just kind of felt like we've been through this journey together for so long, and we've only known my SCUT 181 manual kiln that I feel like it's only right to really see and do one last kiln opening in this house, in this kiln, before I actually make an official move to not only a new scenery, a new studio, but also in a new kiln. I genuinely don't know what's gonna happen to this kiln afterwards. This kiln is very old. It's probably 30, closer to 40 years old. And to be honest with you, I've probably been working with a handicap. I'd probably get much better colors and a much faster yield as far as kiln time. And I'd probably be saving a lot more electricity if I just got another model of kiln. So this might just like have to go. So today I present to you the last kiln load I will ever have in this kiln. I'm not kidding, I don't even have any more clay or bisqueware. I made sure not to buy any more so that I wouldn't make a giant mess while I'm cleaning the studio because I can't make a mess as I clean the mess. That just seems dumb. So we are finally saying bye to our old SCUT 181 manual and without any further ado, this is the very last kiln opening we will have in this kiln. And I'm pretty sure most of you know how this goes by now. We put stuff in the good pile, we put stuff in the bad pile, and then we put stuff in like the, the pile up there where I might reglaze it, but I'm in California and it's 103 and everything's on fire and I don't want to be here too long. Sorry, that was the heat talking, not me. We also, as far as Dirty Potter tradition goes, usually start off with the thing that we found the least impressive in the kiln and then we ramp up to what we found the most impressive. Your job is to tell me in the comments down below whether you agree with me or not, because even though I made it, I still have a preference and whatever you say is probably wrong. I mean, like your opinion does matter but I still have my favorite. Let's start out with this mug right here. Now this mug actually kind of features a technique I haven't shown you guys yet, which is how to invert your walls, right? So the mug itself looks like a normal mug until you look at the sides and you realize that it's actually pushed in a little bit on all sides. The reason this mug gets the bottom spot and it's the least impressive thing in the entire kiln load is because it's essentially one color. Like th this is a nice form, this is a nice big mug. The handle is big enough for I me mean, to stick two fingers in or my thumb in or, you know, I can hold it just fine. It's a nice sizable mug. It's nothing's wrong with the form. It's just one color though. You can look a little bit closer at it and see that it really tried to make a good color, but um, I honestly don't see anything too special about it as far as the color goes. This was dipped in floating blue and then Tenmuku gold on the top. You can tell the gold flakes right in the crack right there. That's how you can kind of tell it was dipped in Tenmoku. Even when you put a bunch of light on it, it's still kind of like, well, that's kind of just one color. And it looks like it's crawling, but it's not. These little spots here are not crawling. They're still glassed over. Like this here and this here, that's just a little color spot. There's nothing really, there's nothing wrong with this. It's just not interesting. We're gonna put this one in the good pile only because there's nothing actually wrong. Oh wait, what's that in the middle? Ooh, that inside is crispy, my guy, what? How did I miss that? That's not even good. Did I dip this in Randy's red and then floating blue and then Tenmoku gold on the outside? Wow. My mom was right. Beauty really is on the inside. Um, I'm really hoping when I get a new kiln that a lot of my glazes will start acting more like this because the bricks in my kiln and the elements in my kiln are super old. I did kind of just change the elements but that still won't bring back the life of the brick, and at the point in which I change the brick and the elements, I might as well just buy a brand new kiln. So we're, we're actually gonna put this one in the good pile now because I'm massively impressed with its insides. You know, like that guy. He's not really attractive, but like, you know, he, he's, he's, he goes to the gym and he's got like a YouTube channel and he's, you know, he's, he works out and he has a job and he's, he, he, owns, he doesn't live with his mom. He's like, you know, he's not hot. He's just, it's, it's the inside that counts. This one here is the runner-up for almost the same reason. Now, I will say, 
I'm massively a fan of these kind of squattier forms, but the same exact thing happened to this cup as did the last cup. It definitely has a little bit more glass, a little bit more color. This is the floating blue, but the thing that I love about this is that it has this weird birthmark. I don't know if you can exactly see it, but the, the interesting thing to me is this little birthmark here that happens on the clay body. I like this a lot. This is, this is one of my favorite things to happen. So what usually happens is you load your kiln, right? And this primarily happens in a kiln that has actual fire in it instead of just heat from electricity, like elements versus a reduction kiln or like real, real fire. But when you put two pieces really close together like this, sometimes the fire will go right in the middle because they're not touching. They'll be fine in the kiln if they're this close. But if they're not touching, sometimes the color of one will jump to the other one. And you can really see this on certain things. Like let's say for example, you glaze this black and you glaze this entire thing green and there's almost no way that this is gonna show black whatsoever and vice versa for this. Sometimes if you put them close enough, especially in reduction kilns, it doesn't happen too often in oxidation kilns, you'll get a little jump of color, right? And it'll make a tiny little birthmark. And you'll see a little bit of a different color or the color that was on this cup on here. And I think that's what happened right here. I mainly think that's what happened because this entire thing is floating blue and sometimes my floating blue just doesn't come out. But it sure in the heck doesn't come out this color. This is the natural color of my floating blue and does not look at all like the birthmark I just showed you. Which is why I really think that that's a birthmark and it's not just a combination of glaze. Plus, this is just a one dip. I dipped this one time, the entire thing is floating blue. No nothing's, there's nothing else on this. So for it to have another flash of color like that, I think it was just too close to something else. It's also my favorite type of handle where you can just kind of like stick your thumb at the bottom and drink like this because I usually hold my cups like this. So we're, we're going to put this one in the good pile. This one here is again my floating blue, but I put a mystery glaze on top. And when I say mystery glaze, I mean it. I actually don't know what the glaze is that went on top of this, but I did kind of dip it at an angle. So you can really see that like I dipped it in floating blue, took it by the rim right here and just went nah, good enough. I've been following this person on Instagram who's talking about specific gravity inside of your glazes and I, you know, it's specific gravity sounds really, really fancy, but really it's just the amount of water in your glaze. That's really all it is. So I've been kind of siphoning off water and adding a little bit of water to more of my glazes and that's what's happening as far as my floating blue goes. My floating blue isn't acting up as much because it's just a tiny bit thicker. I essentially just took some water out. She's actually a great follow on Instagram. I will put her name right here and in the description below, just in case any of you don't want to actually go find her, but she's a great source of knowledge, especially for specific gravity inside of your glazes. But check it out. This is how my floating blue comes out now, specifically because of the knowledge that she has shared with me, just on her Instagram alone. So this one is going to go inside the good pile once more. Choo choo. This one is actually one of my favorite ones. It, I find it really interesting because I don't do a lot of underglaze and I don't do a lot of uh, slip trailing. For those of you who don't know what that is, I'll go over it at a later time on the channel. But underglaze is just that. You can essentially put glaze underneath another glaze and as long as the cone isn't too high, it'll come out. I used this underglaze I got quite some time ago. I actually got it so long ago that I don't know what cone it is and I don't know what brand it is. It's all torn up and that's how long ago I got this underglaze. But I do know that it can go up to cone 10 and I'm not firing to cone 10, so meh. I also have been experimenting with a lot of underglazes and I find that even though the bottle says like, hey, only use this at cone five or six, I can very easily take it to cone seven or eight and it usually, usually, not all the time, survives. And I don't think this is one of those cases, even though I can't read the label, but I like to do it to make these kind of effects. This is just a clear coat from the Digital Fire Clear recipe that I've already shared with you guys on the channel. And this underglaze, of course, I put the underglaze first and then I clear glossed it on the very top. This is actually the cheat mode cup that I showed you guys on the how to make a mug video where I was like, look, if you don't want to pull a mug handle and you just don't know how to or you don't have the time, get a piece of clay, sculpt a little handle to where you can grab it and this still qualifies as a mug. I actually have no problem with these types of mugs um, other than that I did it really quick and it kind of looks a little bit ugly to be honest with you, but you guys have seen the handles that I make usually like this 
And you guys have also seen the stuff that I do real quick. This took me like literally four seconds. This one's actually pretty close to the top spot. Um, I like this one simply for its design because I don't usually do this. But I will say that it was my last kiln load and I only had like five or six things left. So, eh, why not, you know? I'm sure a patron would love to get this in the mail. So I'll probably be sending this off pretty soon. Now this one is actually one of my favorite ones. This one is just floating blue. There's nothing else on this. It's just I, I mixed my glaze really, really well and my floating blue came out extra dank. <laughs> I want to say the only real issue I have with this is that it's a little bit ovular, if that's a, if that's a word. You can kind of see it right there. I would prefer it to be perfectly round, but that is uh, a fault of mine. When I was making it, I either took it off the wrong way, or I didn't take care of it right, or I didn't let it dry it slow enough, or you know I might have handled it incorrectly or put a little bit too much pressure. I could have very easily grabbed it like this, squeezed a little too hard, and then put it in the kiln instead of gently grabbing it like I should. This is some of the best floating blue I've ever had in my life. Inside and out. It, it's, it's, man, I'm gonna keep this just because, well number one, my, my finger lines are still in there and that's always kind of a natural thing that crafters really like. It's like, oh, these aren't just, this isn't just some cup. This is like a potter's identity, a potter's finger lines are in here and you can feel them and you know, there's a bunch of sad stories about potters who have died and their family buys back all the pieces that have finger lines in them just because it really holds a piece of them in it. Nothing wrong with the bottom, nothing wrong with it. There's, no, there's nothing wrong with this. This would be considered to me like an eight out of 10 as far as a simple cup goes. If I had a student that made one of these, I'd be really happy. We're gonna put this one inside the good pile because its color is just so fantastic. Okay, these are the last two, and I'm a little bit torn on these. There is a clear winner in my mind, although I will say that one of them just has like a, you, you'll, you'll see, you'll see. This bowl right here came out phenomenal. You have no idea how well it came out. Let me show you. This bowl is shattered on the outside, has two different types of blue and one type of black on the outside as well which kind of accidentally gave it this slight oil spot effect. This, I would like this every time, please. All the time, all day, every day, sweet Susie. Along with the chattering, this looks amazing. Look, just, it's the glaze alone. It really is. The issue that I have with this bowl, the reason why I think the outside is so good and I love it so much, but it doesn't get the number one spot in my brain, is because the inside came out kind of doo-doo butts. It does, it feels raw right here, you hear that? That noise doesn't happen when you have glass. See, it's not porous on the outside. I am actively going to try and reglaze this. I'm going to put it in the okay pile because I just, I mean, just, just look at it. I, it's fantastic, it's fantastic. I'm trying to get a close up for you guys, but there's so much light. It's like, I literally, I have too much light in this studio. That's, that's the, <laughs> that's the thing, the thing everyone wants more of in their studio, I have too much of. But hopefully you guys can really see the glaze right there. I'm trying to block as much of the light as I can with my big potter body. Dante, Dante, tell us what you did to the bowl. We, we watched these so that we can know glaze. I don't know. I don't know what I did to the bowl. Okay, you can just go ahead and push the dislike button now because I didn't do a thorough enough job that you wanted. I didn't write it down, I'm not gonna lie to you. I hope in editing I can make this a little bit more clear for you, but this glaze is fantastic. I'm gonna put it in the okay pile because I am going to retry this later. This bottle right here is the winner of the kiln opening to me. This is Randy's Red dipped in a little bit of floating blue. The Randy's Red actually came out really nice this time. It, it comes out weird colors like this, um, but I put floating blue right on the symbol right here. Dante, show us the symbol. What is it? Is it a special dirty potter symbol? Is it, is it, is it? No, it's it's actually just a flower that I overglazed. I'm not gonna lie to you, I just, it's a, it's a flower. But I glazed the inside as well, so this is actually a functional piece. Uh, potter tip, if you make a nice bottle and you don't glaze the inside, that it, it's just bisque on the inside. It means you can't actually use it as a functional thing. 
This is probably one of the rare pieces where I didn't trim the foot. I just kind of palmed it inwards. I wasn't going to sell it. I'm not production pottering. I trim most, if not all, my feet except for this one. And I'm not going to lie to you. It's just because this is the very last piece that I created in the studio, in this studio. And I just didn't have enough clay to trim it. So I just kind of like... <laughs> there it goes. Good to go in a kiln. It's only fitting that my favorite piece of the last kiln load in the studio be the last thing that I made as well. And probably the winner of the, of the, the final kiln load, at least in my mind. I know a lot of you guys uh, have different opinions from me, but you know, I, I respect those opinions, but this is still the winner to me. This one is for sure going inside of the good pile. I don't know what I'm going to pair this with. Whenever I usually make bottles like this, I usually try and get the same glaze combination on two little cups. Just in case somebody wants a nice little sake set. I know ceramic artwork and, and Japanese culture, not just Japanese, but Asian culture in general kind of go together since they have such a deep rooted foundation in this art form. So I like to kind of make little sake sets because that's what people would usually imagine using these for. So I'm gonna put this in the good pile. Actually, this goes in the great pile. This goes in the Dante's gonna uh, drink, um, not alcohol, because I don't drink that much, but um, oh, you know what? I might have a cork to this. So check this out, right? Whenever you go to enough art parties and enough art galleries, sooner or later you are going to get into the tier of art parties and art galleries where people think it's fancy to drink cheese and drink wine. And because of that, they usually have a plethora of wine bottle corks just laying around that they don't know what to do with and they're too lazy to recycle. So what I'll often do is whenever I make bottles, I'll pull out one of these and try and fit any one of these in here. And sometimes, sometimes it works. Yeah, see that one's going in. Look, see? That is airtight right there. See, look, goes all around the place. It does take a little bit of effort to pull it out and you can, sometimes I will trim off or cut off little pieces of cork in order to fit this in here, but yeah, this this works fine. This would be great. And then we'll just keep the rest of the corks <coughs> over, over here <laughs> for no reason. <laughs> well, thank you Dirty Potters for joining me today. I know this one was kind of short. Um, usually my videos last a little bit longer than 10 minutes. This might be around 10 minutes, but I really, I, I didn't have a reason. I could have easily just taken this step out of the kiln and not showing you, but I really wanted to have not only a video document, but also to share my experience of my last kiln load inside of my Scut 181 Kiln Ghost with you guys. I, I wanted to share that experience. So thank you guys for joining me today. I really appreciate you guys being along with me for this journey. We are almost at 20,000 subscribers. If you guys have not hit the bell next to the subscribe button, are we even friends? Do you even like me? Kiki, do you love me? If you'd like to see any more of my actual artwork, the links are always down below for your beautiful Potter eyes to see. We have the P.O. Box down there, the Facebook fan page, and we have a fantastic Discord community full of a bunch of glaze recipes and a bunch of helpful dirty potters. It's, it's growing. There's like 300 people there right now. But thank you guys for joining me today, and I will see you dirty potters next week. You know, the really messed up thing is that this entire kiln load had no mistakes in it. Like everything came out pretty good, except for one thing. It's a little bit sad because it kind of feels like my kiln is like, no, please, please don't get rid of me. I'll be better. I'll be better for you.